I have two. So I'm Addie Gerard with Third Man Agency, and I am a communications consultant and strategist. I also am a coach for startups and executives and leaders in business and a passionate inner source and open source advocate. Brittany? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. This is really exciting. And no joke, what I just put in the chat, I did not realize ABC. I did it. That was that was my moment there. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to crack up about that every once in a while throughout this presentation. So yes, yeah, so Brittany I. Stennis, I am the open source strategist for Fannie Mae. I focus heavily on um, open source implementations, community building, as well as we've stood up a very dynamic and robust inner source program. And I'm really excited to share some of those things that we've done today. Um, so yeah, it's it's really exciting. So yeah, thanks for having me. Um, Sean? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see everyone um, introduce themselves in the chat and where, they are, where they're where they from around the world. Um, I'm Chan Vung. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm based in Colorado um, in the USA. I'm a technical program manager with the Comcast Open Source Program Office, um, the OSPO. Um, so I just want to point out that we're actually, the Comcast OSPO is the first all-woman OSPO that we know of out there. Um, and so it's it's great to be able to um, work with um, all women in my OSPO and be on this panel today with, uh, with other great women. Um, I've been with the group for about two and a half years. And my, I'm primarily focused on upstream contributions, but um, I love that our OSPO also equally emphasizes the inner source program as well. So thank you for having me. Can you give me a definition of inner source? I know it's really, really difficult to do it. I know there's like something like 60 or 70 definitions out there, but can you give me each of your definitions of it? A uh, sure thing. Uh, I'll kick this one off. So how I've always just kind of thought of inner source is it's applying the same principles and practices of open source, but behind your company's firewall, right? A very standard, straightforward kind of definition. But, you know, going back to what you mentioned, Olive, there are so many different variations of the definition of inner source, and there are many different enterprises that are adopting it different ways, right? I think that we need to kind of unify the definition there because you have this large group of wonderful practitioners here at Intersource Commons that we, we are very focused on that common thread to kind of lean into the industry to do things to develop in this particular methodology. And I think it'd be really important to have that unified definition of what inner source is to set that industry standard because there's so many different facets for me, for example, financial financial institutions that are leveraging it, why can't we be kind of focused on the same sort of collaborative spirit as somebody that's working potentially in agriculture, right? We, you know, that I find that to be, I think it'd be interesting to have a unified thread. Yeah, and I can agree with Brittany anymore than that. I, um, I think there are a lot of people um, leveraging inner source practices and they're doing it, but they just might not be calling it inner source. And it's really happening across all fields, tech, financial industries, um, academics and government. Um, and I think because of that, the definition and perspective of inner source really varies. So I think having a unified definition um, could be helpful. I know that there are uh, four common principles to inner source. Um, and we have this on the, the ISC website, but um, they are openness, transparency, prioritized mentorship, and voluntary code contribution. So four common principles, um, even though there may not be a unified definition right now. Um, and I'd say that if those principles are um, already happen, happening in your organization or in cross-functional work that you, you're doing and it's being done successfully, um, there's a lot of value in then taking that a step further to offering inner source benefits widely across the company and, and then calling it inner source. Um, so I, I think, again, people are doing it, but it, they may not be uh, taking it a step further and calling it inner source. And Adi. I think when you look at um, 
the definition of inner source, I love what both of you said, and I agree with that. That's how I've explained it to many people in terms of here are the principles and it's the adoption of open source within an organization um, as a software methodology. But I think about from, from a comms perspective, a lot of workplace failures, in fact, 86% of workplace failures are attributed to misunderstandings uh, both from the executives and the employees and the miscommunication and understanding. So when you think about a new concept, especially one that has as much attention and hype and excitement around it as InterSource, it's so critical to build understanding and consistency around the principles of it uh, so that you don't have those workplace failures or, or lack of understanding that ends up you know, creating these gaps and preventing really higher efficiencies and productivity coming out of this methodology. I love that you mentioned higher uh, efficiencies. I think that that's really important because a unified definition is one thing, principles behind the firewall, that that's great, but you're absolutely right. There are goals, right? Engineering efficiency, that's number one, that's huge. And that's why people may not be knowing what they're, that they're leveraging inner source practices, but they want to be more efficient, right? We want to ensure that our people, that's another goal is people development and happiness is very, very huge. We also just want to encourage, you know, maybe even the preparation for open source, but along all of those lines, we are getting to that efficiency forward and towards that buzzword of innovation. We could discuss a whole other panel of what innovation means, but I think that that's really important to align that into the definition as well. Thank you all. Um, Chan, you mentioned the ISC. What is the ISC? What, what, um, what does it actually mean? The inner source commons yeah the um inner source commons foundation um it, it, sorry <laughs> the inner source common Th commons foundation um is an organization um that brings together practitioners uh who are doing inner source um and i'd say that over the years it's seen amazing growth um we've uh, seen over 3,000 members in the ISC Slack channel, almost 1,700 followers on social media platforms. And so we, we know that there's a lot, of, there's deep interest and value um, in InnerSource. And the foundation really brings together all of the best practices and education and knowledge that there is in InnerSource. Um, so there are patterns um, that you can learn about. There are books that have been written um, on the Slack channels. There are working groups that people can become part of. Um, and so if anyone here is new to ISC, feel free to introduce yourselves, uh, whether in this call, um, in, a, in a working group, or feel free to schedule one-on-ones with members of the community. I love that you brought up patterns because they're such an integral part of the inner source community and such a vital resource that we're seeing used often. It's the codified best practices for inner source. And what it does is it breaks down different contexts and different problems that inner source solves. And it gives you kind of a roadmap on how you can address that within your organization. So if you haven't seen the patterns, I encourage all of you to check out patterns.innersource.com, innersourcecommons.com, innersourcecommons.com. Did I get that wrong? Olive? No, no, that's right. I'm just going to get into the chat now. Okay, great. She's going to drop it. Uh, anywho, the patterns are a critical component because one of the wonderful things about open source and the mentorship and transparency that this enables is people to be able to quickly move to this and use the knowledge that's available. And so the patterns are repeatable. Again, best practices. It's a fantastic asset. Um, and you can always contribute to them. You know, we are always looking for people to look at how they can and how their adoption of inner source within the organization can be contributed back to the commons and become its own pattern. And then you could be on this call and, and be talking about what your pattern has brought and how the impact that you've seen it make on your organization. So I think patterns was one of the first things that really wowed me about InterSource Commons because it provides so much value to the community and enables so many people to 
come to this methodology and implement it on their own. That's so sweet that you said like that, you know, the, the patterns wowed you, you know, what I joined the community back in 2019, the InterSource Commons community. I was green as green could be, right? I've never worked in an open source program office. The only open source that I leveraged was for this uh, fancy sneaker company where I ran their IT infrastructure. I had no idea, right? And then I joined an OSPO. And all of a sudden, one of my mentors was like, why don't you check out this community here? I was like, oh, okay, InterSource Commons. There is where I started learning. I got the InterSource checkbook or the checklist, right? That's a PDF downloadable checklist that you can get on InterSourceCommons.com. And all of a sudden, this whole concept of software engineering being old greeny that I was, it started making a lot of sense to me, right? I, I harnessed what I used for InterSource Commons was how to be a strong software developer, how to really structure a project, how to actually work within a community. And this, that's where I started. And I remember InterSource Commons, going back to what Addie was saying, like you could be up here speaking. This was the first place that I ever gave a public talk, right? So I had all my club soda, my coffee. I was nervous as could be, but I didn't need to be because this is one of the most welcoming communities. And honestly, the work that everyone's doing with the patterns, enabling the right practices, I think that that is so beneficial. But one of the other beneficial things is the kindness that you find here, right? This is, this is a non-competitive space where like-minded individuals are coming together to try to build the best in class products that we can. Um, and really change the, the engineering culture. So that's really how, what InterSource Commons means to me. Yeah, I, I'd say for me, uh, the thing that stands out the most is also the community. I think when you have a good community and you're surrounded by good people that you like working with, it makes it easier to be open, uh, to collaborate and to share knowledge. And um, I, I completely agree with you, Brittany, in that like coming into this community, I felt um, relaxed and just, it was just easy to be able to work with others. Um, and so the ISC community has been a, a great home. I would actually say from, from my perspective as well, it's very flat. There's no high, very little hierarchy. Everyone speaks to everyone else. It doesn't really matter your position. And, and in terms of Slack on the general Slack, you can contact anyone, you can put things out there and you'll generally get an answer, you know, or an encouragement or something. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're new or if you just want to find out something, it is, it's a lovely community to be part of. But uh, I guess we better move on a little bit. Um, what problems does it solve for you, inner source? Um, I'll go first on this one. Um, so one of the things that I see come up often with my clients. And one of the reasons that I end up advocating and helping to implement inner source is um, organizations have a limited number of engineers who work for them. And as we all know, the world pretty much runs on software these days. So your software engineers are highly valuable, in demand, incredibly important to your business and to the success of your business. And so when you see organizations uh, look and you look at job listings, there's a ton of job listings for engineers. Everyone is looking for them. And when you have great engineers, you want them to be happy. You want them to stay. You want them to be a part of your organization and really live the values of your organization. And InterSource is a great way to connect culturally and build that connectivity um, for, for engineers and for the team internally. But, but one of the things that InterSource does that I don't think is talked about so often is, you know, sometimes things go wrong in software. They go wrong and you don't have the extra 10 to 20 engineers that you'd like to have to be able to come in and solve the problem so that you're not down or you don't have a glitch or whatever the case may be for your, um, for your environment. When you have InterSource as a component of your business, you enable more mentorship, you enable more visibility, you enable people to be able to move very quickly to the area where there's the problem with familiarity 
and to be empowered to be able to take the actions necessary to get problems solved faster, right? So when you what you see in organizations with a strong inner source culture is engineers are able to come in. If someone says, hey, I've got a problem and you have upskilled and brought on and created more mentors and more trusted committers within your organization, you have people to call and they can come in and help and solve this before it becomes a major business issue, which is exactly what senior leaders are looking for uh, in today's culture. There's a lot, there's a lot of change, there's a lot of pressure. And so InterSource really empowers the business, it empowers the engineering team, and it gives you backing for when things go wrong. Yeah, I, I, Addie, I think you bring up a really great point, and I love that you use the words enabling and empowering because that's really what inner source is supposed to be doing. Um, and I think that you're able to do so much more with inner source, um, opposed to having the limited amount of engineers that you talked about and potentially a single point of failure. Um, I think that's especially true when you're considering uh, security and quality. So when you have inner source, you really do allow more eyes on the code. You allow you enable our the technologists to um, uh, find bugs and fix them more quickly. Um, you empower them to um, share knowledge um, with each other and discuss their common problems to potentially come up with their own solution. Um, but it, I, I want to kind of go back to uh, the question of like, what does this solve and what are the challenges to it? And I think um, though there's an opportunity for improved security and quality of code, like that's, that's kind of what it solves. I think the challenge is being able to translate that value. Um, but I, you know, again, being in ISC, we're really lucky that there are other members with experience in translating inner source value in their organizations and then sharing that back to the rest of the community. Um, I actually have two resources I'm gonna share in the chat. And one of them is um, from Zach Copert at GitHub, who wrote a blog post on uh, securing and delivering high quality code with inner source metrics. And so I think those metrics really are able to show the value um, back to the, back to leadership or back to your organization or, or and or the community. Um, and then the second resource I wanna share is um, an inner source pattern on balancing security and openness. Um, I think those two things have really um, helped, in, again, in showing value and, and solving some of the challenges that we're facing with specifically with security. Yeah, and I like that idea of showing value, right? So for most of us, we work for the business, right? What is the business? Many of us don't know the business, ooh, right? Nobody really, really knows. But at the end of the day, we're still reporting back to the business. And so we have to determine a way, okay, engineering happiness is great. That's amazing. That's what we want, you know, and I am a huge advocate for it. I that's what I definitely believe in. But at the end of the day, I also do believe in job security, right? That's really important to me because I need to have a job. So I, I look at inner source from a business lens too on how to associate the concept of cost avoidance. I don't like to say cost savings because when the second you say savings, you have to justify that somehow, some way. And that is a very hard exercise, especially if you work in an open source program office, it is a very hard exercise. So you want to say something like we've avoided X because of this. And one of the things that I'm really starting to implement within our inner source program, because our inner source program has matured quite a bit, which we'll talk about, I think a little bit later, is this concept of chargeback models, right? Chargeback models and transfer pricing. If project A is being supported by project B, a, why can't A merge into B, right? Why can't the resources that were allocated for this initial project be brought into this core large scale inner source project? Why can't we move these resources and our team members over to support a more impactful project to identify 
what other things could we replace and or transfer those prices to, right? And that's very, very important. So when you reach this level of, even if you identify within your own organization, you don't need to have initially 50 inner source projects. You don't need to have entire verticals completely open to start this kind of thinking. I think that it's really smart to kind of think about it in a smaller scale picture first. I have all of these projects that three, like start with two to three projects, start identifying downstream your downstream users, what they're using it for, right? See how you can incorporate through a grooming of a backlog to bring them into the project, really leveraging that community management side of the house. I think that that's one good way that you can look at it because now all of a sudden you might be saving some cloud costs or avoiding cloud costs. Now you're also going to be able to look at your engineer's hours saved. This engineer no longer needs to file a ticket to hit this project or to get something from this project. They don't need to wait on that team. They're already a part of that team. So that's a good way that you can look at it as well from an inner source perspective. And I think that when you start avoiding costs, you could re potentially reallocate funding. One of the biggest things that I'm really pushing for this year um, is inner source as a job creator, right? Community management is so important for the success of these projects. Community management is so important for the success of your inner source initiative. And I think if you could look towards hours saved, you could look towards chargeback pricing, chargeback models, you as your inner source program could potentially justify to bring in that strong community manager. And then you can start growing from there. And so that's a good way to justify value. I think one of the challenges that I have faced within trying to figure this out is I took on too much thinking that I needed to have 35 projects in the pipeline. I needed to do all of these things all at once. No. What I learned is when you scale back, you can start to think a little bit more clearly. I just want to add it really quickly, Brittany, because that was so brilliant. The other thing that that does is it also enables time for innovation. You know, innovation, everyone's like, we're all trying to innovate. We need to keep going ahead and spend some time thinking about it. Well, in order to have innovation, you need to have space dedicated to think and, and have that time. And that also, give, I know, right, buzzwords. I love it. But it's really, it. you need the time. And so I... I had to throw that in there because I was like, that was so spot on. And it also allows for the innovation that businesses need to be successful. The yeah. business, innovate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add another buzzword, but like developer velocity is always talked about. And I think it goes back to what Brittany was saying on developer efficiencies. And, um, and I, for those, I really think that like, if you can, if you have inner source projects um, available where people can take them and um, be able to get to the point where they don't have to keep spinning up their own platforms and their own um, environments and you have something already ready for them in inner source space, that really helps with the developer velocity, getting them to be more efficient so that they can then innovate Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we've covered a fair bit there. I've, I think we've actually covered the next bit I was going to talk to you about, but maybe there's more tips and tricks that you could recommend on how people could use it. Or have we covered a lot of that already? Okay, work away. I think, Brittany, you're straight in there first, are you? Um, yeah, so I think I wanted to send it to Chan first because I think that she's got a really great example of what they did, and then I'd like to build upon that. I think that would be really good because it's a great step, it's a great jumping off point there. Yeah, I'm happy to go. Um, so I think I mentioned earlier that there's the four principles of inner source or four common principles, and one of them is mentorship. And so I was really lucky to be mentored by Fei Wan, who is a distinguished engineer at Comcast um, and also a member of ISC. Um, and so Fei, along with Sebastian Spear, who is who's also part of ISC, worked together on creating a mind map, uh, which is a visualization of all of the inner source patterns. And I, Addie said that when she joined, it really wowed her and it did for me too. So like when I joined, um, I'm, I'm a very visual person 
And when I saw that, it was helpful for me to see like how to organize my thoughts around inner source and then where I can take advantage of the different patterns that other people had already gone through. Um, so like, I wish I had that in my personal life, right? Like you could just like, hey, this is where I'm at in life. Like this is the challenge I have and this is what other people have gone through. And, and inner source um, comments has just that, uh, which is which is really great. Um, but if you look at the mind map, there's different phases. Um, and when I joined, our program was at the grow phase. So if you see the grow phase, there's some discovery challenges and patterns that can help you get through uh, growing out your program. So for instance, if you're if, if you're not able to find a list of inner source projects or projects in your organization to work on, one of the patterns or solutions is creating an inner source portal or a gig marketplace to help. Um, so in the past year, we our team has been able to leverage an existing gig marketplace and the developer portal for our inner source project discoverability. Um, but with that, in in building up that portal for people to go and say, hey, I this is a project I can use. Um, we, we learned in that process that it wasn't really about the list of inner source projects. And, and Brittany said this, you know, hey, you can have 50 projects on there, but are people really using them? And I, you know, open source is kind of the same way. Um, so we learned that the list wasn't really um, the how people can take advantage of inner source. It was really building up the communities around that list and those projects. Well, where does, you know, this particular inner source project belong? Does it go in a, a community like Kubernetes or cloud native? Um, and who are the people talking about that? So it's, I, I think it's been really helpful to have the pattern tell us that, hey, this helps with discoverability, um, but then it's building out that even more to think through, well, how do we build up the community to make it a successful in their source project once once people have found it? Um, so I guess mm -hmm. like kind of- I agree with that. Yeah. Go ahead, Brittany. I, I was gonna say just in summary, like look at the mind map, review patterns, connect with others in the community um, to hear more about it and um, how it makes sense for your use case. And then if if a mentorship comes out of it, I, I think that's great. Absolutely. And I think too, the quality of the projects themselves as well, right? Going back to what I was talking about earlier, it's, it, you need to have a community management perspective for this. You need to have a, a very dedicated community manager that understands the mind map, definitely understands the principles because it all goes back to what we were talking about too. The definition of inner source is very different from who you talk to, even within your own business, right? And so when you're bringing all of these particular projects into, they've been identified and earmarked as a potential great inner source project, what do we have to do now? We now have to make sure that they understand inner source. We have to make sure that they understand the impact of their project. And we also have to walk them through how to get a project inner source ready, right? How many people, even if you want to use the little reaction symbol, has gone into your particular source code management system, saw a project, zero documentation. I have no idea what this is. Why is this here? Why are we spending money on this? Going back to chargeback models. We need to be able to have a space where people can go and we can't always hold their hands to do it. So within your portals, you should have clear, detailed guidance, right? The team should be able to go through, see a checklist. Mind maps are very helpful for that as well, because the checklist, the way that the mind maps branch out, really helps people focus on those particular targets. And then also with that, now that they have their project potentially ready, why don't we assess the maturity of it? right? Do they actually know that they're ready for inner source? Well, what we've done is we've provided them an assessment, a self-guided assessment to look at their project, juxtapose that against their maturity levels of one to five, ready to go, 
let's talk to the community manager again, also a downloadable scorecard that they can then share with their team to then get their team's perspectives on assessment for the project. Because if you have two developers that are scoring a three and then two developers are scoring a five, they need to talk to each other to say like, are we really ready? Are we really mature enough to take this on? And so those are some really great additional resources that you could bring into your portal and into your inner source program. I love that, Brittany. Um, that so from from my perspective, as I work with organizations, I tend to spend a lot of time working between the technical side of the business and the business side of the business, because as we all know, there's this, this huge gaping hole between the two in terms of understanding where we're coming from. And so one of the things that I find is being able to articulate how how inner source supports and drives the business and builds to the organizational goals, right? Every organization has their goals that they have and that what they're trying to achieve and finding that connection and getting um, that executive understanding about where the value is. Going back to earlier comments we made about what this looks like in terms of cost avoidance or um, I know I mentioned innovation, right? So revenue, revenue driving activity or opportunity costs that we aren't able to move quick enough to to the market because we don't have enough time uh, because we have duplicative efforts, right? Uh, within our organization. So that's one of the things that I always encourage and work on doing is creating that connection between the organizational goals and how this initiative, the InterSource initiative supports it and serves the business need. The other thing that I find that is a differentiator, a key differentiator for success is active sponsorship, right? One of the things that any any initiative needs is active sponsorship from executive, executive support. And so visibility to that is critical. Uh, in fact, the some of the research shows that when an organization has active sponsorship, a part of it, you have a 73% more likelihood of being successful and being able to acquire that ROI, right? The human factor ROI, right? How quickly is it adopted? How thoroughly is it utilized? How proficient are the people who are using it? And those, those components are revenue driving pieces, right? And so leadership buy-in participation and active sponsorship is helpful in getting through and getting momentum on your inner source initiative. The, um, another thing I'm, I, I like research, so I'm going to bring up another stat. Um, but when you look at, right, everybody is trying to move so quickly in business and the faster we move, the faster, you know, the pressure is on the organization. And so research shows that about 50% of the resistance or what would cause a movement to slow down um, is because of these gaps of understanding about what this is and how important it is for the business. And so I can't stress highly enough how critical it is to make sure that you've aligned what inner source is doing for your business with your business side of the business. I, I know I'm saying business 16 times, but I think you're with me. If you don't have that, you will lose traction. Um, and without the presence of your sponsors, you're not going to see the adoption. And so those are some really critical things that are necessary in order to be successful in your inner source executions and in being able to move quickly through and grow your maturity as a program. I think that sounds great. Um, I see there's some questions coming in there, but what I'm going to do is try and just move to the next part. And if we have some time at the end, we can look at some questions if that's okay. But where do you see the future of InterSource? Where do you see this going um, from each of your opinion? Each of your perspective even. I can, I can talk about this. Um, 
So I'm not sure, like, I'm thinking more about like this year and the next few years for this. And I think with the economic downturn that we're experiencing, I could see more companies um, looking into Intersource as a way for, I think um, someone put it in the chat, cost optimization or uh, really increasing cost savings, reducing duplicate efforts and finding ways to um, optimize processes and centralizing services. Um, so I think that because of the way the economy is going, I think Intersource is really here to stay. Um, and in the, and because of that, I'm actually really excited to see the evolution of it and how it, it's going to change um, as the, as the economy changes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, tr I try not to look at the, the economic side of things. I try not to because it's a little, little depressing, but I also do think that the future of Intersource is going to be relatively pretty robust and it is here to stay. I think that one of the things that we can find, it would behoove us to spread the same message as a large community of 3,000 plus people to kind of get that definition down pat and that people can start adopting the processes better. I also think that we are going to see stable or more stable projects if doing things the right way. I think that, you know, we're going to see more innovation when we're all collaborating together as opposed to working against one another. I, I'd like to think of inner source as the great ego killer, right? You know, as one of the things where I don't necessarily, maybe not that, but like one of those things, like a good equalizer, like a great place where people can come and realize like this project is not more important than this project. I'm no more important than this, right? We want to get people, you know, more on the same page. I think that also from a financial regulatory body, we're going to see this more and more. And I think that we're actually going to be seeing the minds of some of our developers change that have been always working so closely behind their own walls that they're going to open up a little bit better. And I think that we're going to see that improved efficiency when people start kind of taking down their own walls. And that's what I'm hoping for. I'd like to see a full scale leverage of inner source maturity, doing it well, in a regulated industry. And I hope that honestly, Fannie Mae is one of the first ones to do it. We're, we're gearing up for it. So maybe a case study, maybe a case study in the future. That would be good. Yes, we always want a good case study. So that would be very good in the future. Um, Adi, what about yourself? I love what each of you said. I think, I, I mean, I think inner source is going to be is going to grow exponentially. Um, looking at some of the external factors, right, there are regulatory realities that organizations are facing um, that that could drive adoption of inner source. Um, I know that there have been some licensing changes across the globe that have been very disconcerting to individuals. <laughs> and I think that it's, I think that the open way and the open source principles and the inner source principles as they, they match are here to stay. And I think that inner source is going to continue to grow, um, especially in organizations that can't move to open source. And I think, and I'm, and you know, what that looks like in the future is something to, to be watchful of as the horizon shifts and changes with, uh, you know, politics and, and licenses. Um, I think that I recently was at the UN where they had a OSPO for good event. And what you saw was academics, uh, uh, universities across the globe adopt that. And I think that you're going to see that same thing with kind of inner source in different ways and more broad adoption of it in newer areas and newer regions that aren't able to fully embrace open source as the way forward, but want to be able to yield the benefits that you see, which, you know, that collaboration, um, which is going to increase your velocity, which helps your business, you know, that mentorship. So you as an individual and in, an engineer contributor are able to uh, advance and grow your career and grow your exposure and grow your senior seniority and connectivity with the organization. These all have huge values to businesses where there's such a competition for great talent right now. 
Um, and so I just think that the future for Intersource is super bright and super exciting. And I'm just so excited to be here and talk to you guys about how impactful this program really is.